Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, we are, we are off once again. This time to the Big Smoke. In England, that is. The Big Smoke is really wherever the heart lies. This old video is about a guy. There is a guy. And I, uh, I talk about a lot of bad lads, but this guy, wow. It's hard to top how much this pork chop sucks. London is our locale, Levi is our name, one of a few, he kinda cycled through a couple, he's testing them out. There's a fair bit in this one, so better start, you know, getting into it. And you know what that means, we have to give it a goo, yeah. West London is our setting for the most part here, now, today. You know, some might say we will find a brighter day. Oh, there is though, would say around this time. I'm not so sure. In the Surrey slash uh, southwest London-ish area, you'll find Heathrow Airport. You'll find Twickenham, the place for rugby, and uh, about 50 million places called something on Thames. It's a pretty affluent area, you know what I mean? Life's good, lots of shit to do, good place to raise a family. But that's not what we're gonna be talking about here now today, no siree. Uh, we got a lot of shit to get into. Starting with, uh, about 20 years, almost to the day of me posting this video. See, the day this story really begins is the 21st of March. 2002. On that day, a 13-year-old girl named Amanda Deller, and she went, she went by Millie, uh, she disappeared on her way home from school. She was a student at Heathside School in a place called Weybridge. It's a good school apparently, and after she finished up that day at about 3pm, her and a friend walked to the railway station. A lot of the story uh, actually takes place around railway stations and bus stops. The public transport in England is, is in the UK is, is very good. This guy was stalking him. And so she got on the train at Weybridge, took it to Walton-on-Thames, which is the next stop, only a couple of minutes, and she in fact would usually get off at the following station at Hersham when going home. But this day, her and a friend were stopping off to get a bite to eat. She called her dad at about quarter to four, saying she'd be home in about half an hour, left her friend and began walking home. She was last seen walking up this road by a friend waiting at a bus stop towards home, and she never made it. She disappeared at around 4.08pm. Cameras further down the road should have picked her up walking. They didn't. That evening, you know, with no answers to her calls, no nothing, her parents, uh, they alerted the police at around 7pm. And then a, then a massive search began for Millie Deller. It led to a mystery that was in every single newspaper. Over 100 police would search the woods, the alleys, the everywhere. The parents were just hoping she, she ran away. She was a strong-willed, vivacious person but she had no reason to. In fact, it seemed more and more likely she had gotten into someone's car, and this was in broad daylight. We're devastated, we're just so desperately worried, and we just want to have Minnie back home with us so much. It was six months later, they finally got an answer to what happened. On the 18th of September, 2002, her naked body was found in the woods by mushroom pickers, about maybe 40 minutes away from where she had vanished. Due to decomposition, the cause of death was unconfirmed. Nothing she had with her that day was, was with her this day, but it was confirmed to be a murder. Who? Well, uh, some people wanted, if you can believe it, to take the credit. Others, not so much. I mean, first of all, right, the police are looking into the dash. As they, that's completely normal, as they always would do, you're more likely to be killed by someone you know, someone within the family. He was cleared though, though pretty quickly. Some uh, nutjobs uh, posted letters to the Dowler family uh, claiming to either be Millie, calling pretending to be Millie, 
or sending letters uh, saying they had killed her. One guy, one was a pedophile who was in prison, was sending letters to her family while he was in prison. He was in prison for assaulting, sexually assaulting a 12-year-old girl, and he was saying, yeah, I did that too. I mean, he didn't. He was just fucked up. Sick shit. But who was the real killer? There was no forensic evidence left to, to give a clue. The day before Millie disappeared, there had been the attempted kidnapping of a 12-year-old girl, three miles from where Millie was taken. So you got a serial. Something something. There's gonna be a lot more of that, uh, that serial. See, the who wouldn't be revealed for quite some time. Uh, not before he struck again. Multiple times. Marcia McDonnell was a 19-year-old student living with her family in the Hampton area. And on the 5th of February 2003, five months after the body of Millie Deller was found, Marcia was attacked. She had been out with some friends that night to go to, to go to the pictures to go see a flick, and was getting the bus back home just after midnight. She got off the bus, started walking through the twisting and turning residential streets, back home that dark night. As she was walking, someone came up behind her and struck her hard in the head with a hammer. There was no one else around, uh, no one saw anything, there was no witnesses, she was just walking. Some fucker ran up behind her, struck her multiple times in the head with a hammer. Neighbors heard a scream after, but the attacker was, was long gone. She was taken to hospital, but she passed away the very next day. Fifteen months later, uh, he struck again. Or tried to. Kate Sheedy was 18 years old at the time. The time being the 28th of May, 2004. She had, once again, after spending the night out with some friends, gotten off a bus and was attacked almost straight away. This was a little different though. No hammer this time. In a, in a place called Isleworth, hope I got that right, Kate, uh, after you know getting off the bus, she was simply crossing the road, right, when just out of nowhere a car just fucking dogged her. Before even crossing the street, she had like a bad feeling about this car because she saw it. She saw the car had the engine running and was just like, if a car can eyeball you, the car was eyeballing her. But the lights, no lights were on inside the car or outside the car. Looked shifty as shit. She was flung into the air and then when she was on the ground, the car went over her again. Mm -hmm. Where does it hurt? Yeah. He ran over you again? Yeah. He ran over you twice? Yeah. And I really hurt. She did sustain serious injuries, but luckily she'd make a full recovery and was able to tell the police everything she had seen. The car had been a white people carrier, tinted windows. The windows are tinted because there would be a mattress and, uh, well, what you would imagine inside. So the police followed up and CCTV showed that the car was in fact following the bus. Like it had just been waiting for someone to get off. Amélie Delagrange was 22 years old in 2004 from France. She was a student living in London for the past two years. She was working at a cafe and was living near Twickenham Green. On the night of the 19th of August 2004, she'd been out with some friends and got the bus home. Now, she actually missed her stop. She got off at a later one than, than she should have. And so she had a further walk to go home. And to get home just a little quicker, she walked across uh, Twickenham Green. A small, uh, well, green. I don't know, there's trees and a football pitch there. What else do you need? Halfway across, Halfway across, much like Marsha McDonald, someone came up behind her and hit her in the head with a hammer. She was found, not long after, unconscious on the ground. But she died a few short hours later in hospital. The investigations, you know, like just previous 
once again sprang up. I mean, in the previous investigations, they kind of had sweet fuck all to go on. They had what they thought was a car, but it was two separate cars. In the Kate one, they had a car, and then in the Marsh McDonald one, they were following that back. They also thought she had been followed in a car. The police asked, you know, public for information, tips, that sort of thing, any names, and numerous names they got, including the one that's in the title of this video. And so the police started looking into any similar attacks to see if there was any kind of pattern here. And that's what led them to what happened a year and a half earlier, the murder of Marsha McDonald. As I said, they noticed something else when following up on the CCTV of both murders. The buses they had been in had been followed, just like Kate Sheedy's attack. They identified the vehicles linked to the tree attacks, and all were linked to a man named Levi Belfield. Who he? Let's get into it. See, these are the four victims. Millie Dowler, Marsh McDonnell, Kate Sheedy, and Millie Delagrange. And there are many, many more victims of this monster. So you've probably noticed uh, some similarities between the victims. In fact, here is another victim, Anna Maria Rennie. In 2001, she was 17 years old. And after getting into an argument with her boyfriend, on the night of the 14th of October in Twickenham, she went out for, for a walk. Clear the noodle. He went up to her and spoke with her. They started chatting away, and then he asked if she wanted a lift home. She said no. He wouldn't take she said no for an answer. He wasn't having it. So then he attacked her. He started grabbing her. He put his hand over her mouth. He started dragging her into his vehicle. Now, luckily, she managed to fight him off, and she made a hasty getaway. She would, four years later, identify that guy as having been uh, Levi Belfield. An ex-girlfriend of Levi's also approached the police, saying she thought he may be responsible for Amelie's death. He was soon put under observation, and after a couple of days, when the police... Oh, God. Witnessed him pulling over to talk to young girls in school uniforms, they quickly arrested him. Reached a line where all this similar stuff's coming up, isn't it? Blondes, buses, Levi's cars. Yeah? Why did you do it? What chance did she have? No comment. No chance at all. Size of that gun over her. Not once, twice. Leaving her for dead. No comment. 18 years old. No comment. Yeah? Like that. Because yeah. something's gone in Levi's head. That's what's happened, mate. It is. Too many similarities, Levi. Too many similarities for the question not to be asked and for you not to say why. No comment. No comment. Because you can't say anything, can you? So, let's get into Levi uh, Belfi- Hey, there he is, the big guy. His face is a dead giveaway because he looks like a sack of shit. You know what I mean? I can't imagine that when this started coming out about what uh, Levi Belfield was being accused of having done. You know, I can't imagine people were like, You what? Nah, I'm sure it was more like, I see it. Look at him. Oh my. <laughs> I mean, I, I know you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover and, and all that. But if I see a book with, with feces on the front of it, I'm gonna assume it's about shit. Levi was born Levi Rabbits in 1968 in Isleworth, so he mainly stuck around the area he hunted his entire life. A real mama's boy, even uh, sleeping in the same bed as his mother, when he got like way too old to do that, so... He's a bit of a psycho, you know, eh, what's that guy? Imagine a scumbag version of that guy. He had, has, four siblings, two bros, two sisters, and was mainly raised in a council estate, his dad passing away from leukemia when he was but a boy. He was kind of fucked uh, from the get-go. There was even a rumor that he, when he was like 14, 15, he fucked his sister's rabbit and then broke its neck. Never thought I would say those words. Another uh, weird, <laughs> real weird incident happened uh, when he was you know, still at a young age. Uh, at about 12, 13, he became friends with a girl uh, who was a, about a year or two older than himself, named Patsy Morris. 
Now, apparently she rejected him or something like that. Um, and a couple of days later, she was found dead. That case is still unsolved to this day. His neighbors, you know, would say he was a nice, chatty guy. He was a, he was a real lad, go crack. Flight's friendly, all the rest. Give you a dig out when needed. <laughs> no bother, pal. But of course, it's the same story with all monsters. That's what's make you know. That's that's what makes them so scary. It's like a transformer, you know, um, Decepticon. That one. Like he'd steal shit uh, from his neighbors all the time. He's like, I like that. I think I'll take it. If you pissed him off, he'd destroy your garden. That sort of thing. Kind of just intimidated basically everyone around him. And you probably already guessed it. He was extremely abusive to his partners. Like. Well, all the classics, uh, beating the shit out of them, making them sleep on the floor. He would make them test his food because he thought they were poisoning him. He was mad as a bag of spiders. Mood swings, buy flowers, then punch your head off. He he had been, you know, quite small as a kid too, and during his teenage years he started weightlifting and doing the roids, which of course roid rage soon following. Amazing how he managed to have eleven children with five different women. But there you go. He would ask his girlfriends to dress up in school uniforms. Guess it was his thing, unfortunately. He also hated blondes. One woman said she found a magazine with the faces of all the women with blonde hair scratched out. That's some creepy shit. He'd call basically any woman with blonde hair an impure slut. He'd also hang out in alleys just waiting for, uh, I guess hopefully for him, a blonde woman to walk down it alone. It seemed that in school he'd been bullied by girls, and so now he was, uh, he was still raging about that one. Now he bullied women, and, uh, well, a lot worse. He hated them. He had a number of jobs, one being uh, a wheel clamping company. Just when you think he couldn't be a bigger cunt. He viewed uh, clamping as like a get-rich-quick scheme. He would basically just go clamping anyone he possibly could, and then intimidate you into paying, you know, hundreds of pounds to, for him to get the clamp off. Another job he had was being a bouncer, where he reportedly raped a number of women after giving them roofies. His convictions went back to when he was a kid. Burglary, fraud, weapons possessions, driving offences, assaults. So, long story short, there's absolutely, absolutely nothing redeemable about Porkchop. And I know I've already said some horrific things, you know, about what he's done, he's like real sick shit, uh, but now I'm absolutely about to ruin your day. Check this out. And so, on the 20th of November 2004, he was arrested. He was formally charged with the murder of Amelie and Marcia, and the attempted murder of Kate in March 2006, and also with the attempted murder of another woman, a woman named Irma Dragoshi. She was waiting at a bus stop, talking to her husband on the phone, when someone prosecutors say Levi, came up behind her with a hammer. She luckily survived, but has no memory of what happened. The reason it took so long to try and finally, you know, um, charge him and all that, uh, is because at the time, there was 27 separate investigations into him for the various shit he'd been doing. The rapes, the fraud, the thievery, the abuse, you... name it. And he denied it all. But, in 2008, he was found guilty of the murder of Amelie Delgrange, Marsha McDonnell, and the attempted murder of Kate Sheedy. The attack on Irma Dragoshi, the jury couldn't decide. He received a whole life tariff. That's life without parole, baby. The investigation, though, into Millie Dowler, one of, the, one of his first victims, um, that wasn't over. And when they found out he'd been living in the area in 2002, well... Now, our next case is proving very hard to crack, the murder of 13-year-old Millie Dowler. Over the past few weeks, there's been a lot of speculation in the media about one man who might have killed her. A name that is in the frame, as far as the media is concerned, is Levi Belfield, found recently uh, guilty of two murders and attempted murder. Is there a connection, as far as you're concerned? I'm certainly very interested in Levi Belfield. What are the connections, then, between this man and Millie? We're trying to trace a red Deunexia vehicle that was seen approximately half an hour after Millie's last sighting in Station Avenue. And you believe that this red car could be the car that was used to transport Millie's body? It's quite possible. What did you say? How come? Sorry. 
found that very interesting, and I'll tell you for why. Because you didn't deny it. No comment. You didn't say, it's not me. No comment. And at no stage over the last two days have you denied any involvement in these offences. No comment. Why is that, Levi? No comment. Why haven't you sat there and said, jumped up and down and shouted from the rooftops, you've got the wrong person? No comment. I find that very strange. Do you honestly believe that your actions over the 21st and the 22nd of March 2002 are the actions of an innocent man? No comment. Then are you an innocent man? No comment. Because if you are, tell us. No comment. I believe you took her off the street that day. I believe your motivation was sexual. And I believe you took her back to Collingwood Place. And I believe you killed her there. That's the truth, isn't it? No comment, sir. That's what happened. At the time of Millie's disappearance, uh, Levi and his girlfriend had been house-sitting for a friend very close uh, to where she disappeared. And so that day he went out, he went out in his girlfriend's car and presumably at some point he was able to lure Millie into his car. He returned that evening to his girlfriend, the house, you know, they were sitting with a girlfriend with, with takeaway and beer and all that sort of stuff. And then they slept there that night in the house sitting house and then at about three o'clock in the morning he said he couldn't sleep. So he was going to go back to their apartment where he had been keeping Millie. When his girlfriend, Emma was her name, arrived to their apartment the next day, she was just, she was flabbergasted to see, uh, to see Levi changing the sheets and the bed linen and all that sort of stuff. Because that was something he never did. When, he asked, when she asked him, you know, why? Why are you, why are you doing that? He said the dog had made a mess. That he had to bin uh, all the bed linen. In 2010, he was charged with Millie's abduction and murder. The following year, he was found guilty. Once again, he was sentenced to life in prison. He later admitted in 2016 what he had done, though he would try and retract that. Now, let it be known, uh, Levi, or Yusuf Rahim as he is known now, uh, in prison, he's been linked to quite, I mean a few, uh, <laughs> I mean a shitload, of uh, other murders and other attacks and other things. In 1996, Lynn Russell and her daughter Megan were murdered. Another daughter, Josie, had been viciously attacked too, but survived. They had all been attacked with a hammer. This happened in a country lane in Kent. Now a guy was sent away for all of this, a fella named Michael Stone, but apparently, Levi confessed to it, and knew things about the murders only the killer would know. Levi said, no, I didn't. Fuck no. Now, an ex-wife said he was with her all, all day, the day of the Russell attack. You know, about 100 miles away, so he couldn't have done it. I'm not sure how much the police, you know, think he was really involved, but they said they're, they're looking into it. So Levi was accused of it, said he didn't do it, but now, apparently, he confessed to it. It is the lawyer for Michael Stone who is saying Levi confessed to it. He he says he has a four-page confession letter, you know, detailing it all. But I mean, you know, he would want that. Let's just see uh, what we will see on that front. I mean, he was already involved in a lot, so it's not gonna be surprising. Come on, and that's the end of uh, this chapter. Levi committed a lot, quite a few uh, bits and bobs. There's a lot he wasn't actually convicted for, but I guess he made a whole life tariffs he got. It's kind of like, well, that'll do. Also, I didn't get into... One thing I didn't get into was the whole news of the world. If you remember their phone hacking scandal, they hacked into Millie Dowler's uh, voicemail before she was found when she was still missing. This gave her parents hope that she was still alive if someone had activated her, her voicemail. So yeah, that was a big load of shite. But this guy, he's up there. Just a horrible piece of humanity, and I'm not even sure he qualifies for that title, the humanity part. Scary shit. Uh, make sure you walk home safe, please. And that is the story of this just irredeemable pork chop. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this whole video. I uh, hope you enjoyed it or found it interesting. At the very least, and uh, yeah, here, listen. Thanks very much. Um, 
here, go on. I'll see you as always real soon in the next old video. Until then, please take care of yourselves, all right? Won't you? I love you. Wake up.